I'm worried about propolis. He's the one philosopher that is not read, is not studied, yet he's the only systematic philosopher produced out of the Europe tradition, Greek tradition. Um, the ability to bring together the entire Platonic tradition and put it into words to be able to reconcile all the dialogues into a unity, to be able to show Greek mythology can fit within it. So he rationalized Greek mythology. He showed Plato had a theology. He wrote commentaries on all the major dialogues. He made intelligible the Parmenides by line-by-line -line analysis. He's, it's the only works that um, that capture the dialectic. He's the, he's the only one. All the other works are gone. But he demonstrated through many examples how the dialectic proceeds through uh, its 24 categories very systematically. Um, he developed that into a systematic exploration of any idea and um, his dialectic which everything he does is based upon essentially is um, eight categories times three which are 24 statements you can say about something in itself if they're things that you can say about itself, what are the consequences upon the, on others? If there is such a thing as a thing in itself and others and the implications of this upon others, then you can also ask, what are the consequences upon these others upon itself? And what are the implications of those three back upon the particular thing in itself? Those are the basic four categories. And the denial of each of these generates another four, so there are eight categories. You can say anything um, about anything in respect to three kinds of judgments. You can say whether or not the thing you're talking about is true. You can say true things about it. You can say things that are not false about it. And you can say things that are both true and false. Therefore, you have three kinds of judgments for each class. There are four affirmative, four negative. Therefore, you can take the idea of likeness, soul, any idea and explore it along these 24 categories and you should be able to exhaust the intellectual content of each one of them. And he showed what kinds of ideas are naturally associated with each one of these stages and that's the great dialectic of Platonic tradition. And he did that systematically in a work called the Parmenides, Commentary on Plato's, Carmen, Plato's Parmenides. That's a giant. So he kind of made Plato available? On the highest intellectual level. On the highest intellectual level. Yeah, he pushed it on the highest level. It, he gave everybody who knows him and is familiar with his writings a particular interesting problem and it's a, it's a in a sense it's a terrible problem in exploring the Parmenides he takes the Plato's Parmenides line by line and shows the integrity behind each one of the sentences in terms of both itself and the whole and to the key ideas in the work 
and he systematically goes through the whole Parmenides this way. And he brings into it the whole Neoplatonic tradition that came before him, especially his teacher Serenius. So that in one work, therefore, we have uh, uh, literally a thousand years of reflection on one dialogue and you walk away from it and, and you, you just have to come to a, uh, a the most amazing kind of question which is if they see this much profundity it took a thousand years to find this much profundity put it all together what kind of a mind must Plato have had to have crafted it with such precision that later someone systematically treating each sentence, both in itself as well as in respect to the other major ideas in the work, can find a unity to the whole thing, a very, uh, very profound unity to the whole thing. So, it, so that's oh, um, about 470 A.D. Yeah, 480. Yeah, so it's a, nearly a thousand years after Plato. Yeah, uh, nine hundred. So uh, the key scholars at, during his own time, by the way, a very prof very interesting community at that time. The people who were most involved in Proclus's thought—that's the highest metaphysical thought that I, I know of—were Ethiopians. In Ethiopia, there was a group that were studying. And uh, they were called the greats, and Proclus mentioned several, several of them. Matter of fact, he talks about one, he said, he knows me better than I know myself. So they, they had a very interesting relationship with Ethiopia then, those days. With the who? Pardon me? With the who? who the Proclus. 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 Had a relationship with the, who? the Ethiopians. There's a, there are, there's a, Ethiopia plays a key role in Greek thought. Oh yeah, and it's been buried by many commentaries, or ignored. But as you can imagine, the opening lines in the Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, in both, which is the religious writings of the Greeks, or the spiritual writings of the Greeks, or the sacred tradition of the Greeks. In both cases, they talk about the gods visiting Ethiopia, and that's where they go to celebrate. That's where they go, as it were, for a. a, a we would, I guess, call it a, a, a retreat. Yeah, a spiritual retreat. Poseidon does that in the Odyssey. And uh, there's a very, very fine work called Black Athena, a two-volume work, which I'd recommend to anyone getting into Greek thought, because that shows the relationship between Greek thought and Africa, especially Ethiopia and Egyptian. I'll think of it in a moment, I'm not sure. It's, I think that it's downstairs in the uh, library, as a matter of fact. Black Athena. Black Athena? Yeah, yeah. Well, certain groups of people say that the, the Greeks were very much influenced by the Egyptians. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. This goes a step, be, see, behind the Egyptians, of course, to the Ethiopians. And uh, uh, the whole origin of Greek tragedy emerged through Aeschylus and the first great play of Aeschylus was dealing with the libation bearers which is really a magnificent study of, of 50 black girls from Ethiopia they're being pursued by men who want to marry them they don't want to marry them and they make a plea to the, to, uh, the king to please protect them, they go into a temple and declare they're Athenians. Oh, pardon me, they declare they're Hellenes. That's different than Athenians. Hellenes. Well, a Hellene, according to Aristotle, you do not gain by birth or by language, but it's a state of mind. And therefore, the king has a very interesting question on his mind. Look here, if I declare that they're Hellenes, I have to defend them. That's my duty. That's what they, my honor is connected with fulfilling the demand that we protect Hellenes. If, I, if we protect them, we have to go to war with their suitors who are coming on ships and they want to capture them, bring them back. And so the drama takes place, the whole drama takes place of how do you tell when someone is a Hellene or not? 
and they're 50, uh, they're beautifully, uh, evidently they're beautifully attired and they're described very beautifully in robes and garments. So the whole drama is how can you tell when a woman is a Hellene, especially in this case, an uh, African woman. And they do it, by the way, they do it in a magnificent, I won't tell you the end, but it's a magnificent way in which they display, they have mindfulness. That's the whole game of Hellene, to be mindful. Be mindful. Yeah, and that's a Hellene, that's what it is to be a Hellene. Well, this is probably a stupid question, but when Troy had the big war with the, uh, over Helen of Troy, yeah. is there some kind of symbolic connection here? With? To the Hellenes and Helen of Troy. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's much deeper than Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, when the Christians came on board history, when they emerged in history, the early writings of the people who were watching Christianity emerge, the interesting comment that was made is, uh, they are only two races. You're either a Hellene or a Jew. And now there's a chance for a third new race, Christians. So in those days, people saw the Greeks as separate and distinct, and Jews as separate and distinct as a separate people. Mm -hmm. Different state of mind. What about the Romans? They're, they're considered they're, Hellenes? They're, they're, they're yeah, considered they're, beyond the pale? Yeah, they're beyond the pale. <laughs> <laughs> the Christians are kind of a mixture of the... Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, now this is an ex what I'm going to do is explore the idea, what is it to be a Hellene? That's what we're doing. That's what we do. So what is it to be a Hellene? It's really how, what is the significance of words? That's what it comes down to. Two things, words and states of mind. What's the value in putting words on states of mind? So I chose four words to play tonight. All right, so we're going to explore this loftiest of all notions, the good and the one. No. There's one idea, of course, we talked about before, and that's the idea of condition. The condition for things precedes the things. The conditions for fire precede a fire. The conditions of anything must necessarily pre precede the thing and the thing cannot emerge without those conditions. Therefore, the idea of conditions and cause are linked, and that's what I'm going to explore. Now, behind both of these words, just to make sure we're together, is if there are a number of things that have a quality, then whatever is the source of that quality must precede it. If there is red, among things, then red must precede redness. That's all. If there are things that are red, well then the, the or redness, that's what we mean when we call say red, the quality red, that's redness. If there is redness among things, like those books are red, then there must be this curious thing, red, that must precede the application of the discovery and the appearance of redness wherever it is. If each thing, if there is a, if, if each thing is a one, then Right? Or if each thing is a one or has a oneness, then the idea of the one must precede it. Same language. If everyone is pursuing what they consider to be good, then that quality of goodness which they are pursuing presupposes the existence of a, of a good independent of the goodness. Now, that's a takeoff point, and we can talk about that later, but that's presupposed in this exploration. Now, here we go. Going back to a great principle, terms vary, relations are constant. 
I want to make sense of that. In all explorations of a Platonic nature, the ultimate term is the good or the one. Now, the, the one principle which governs all of this reflection is that in any progression of one thing from another, there is always a likeness between the thing that produced it and the product. Likeness is the first governing quality, likeness. Therefore, if there is such a thing as the good or the one, it must follow then that there is going to be a generation of, from the good or the one and necessarily it's going to be goodness or oneness in the same way if there is goodness there has to be some sense of perfection completeness wholeness, whole, unity, unitary, union. See, all of these things are generated from one another and we can talk about the way in which they emerge naturally in a progression but I just wanted to set that out because we're going to be using those terms in a few minutes. All right, we're going to make sense of this now. Terms vary, relations are constant. Now, here are the four ideas. Bread, lovers, learning, contemplation. And what are we going to do? We're going to use this language over here and we're going to explore it under the idea that relations are constant, the terms may vary. Okay? Now, would you agree there is something very interesting about the judgment wholeness? Like everybody likes bread. What is the highest judgment you can make about bread? It has wholeness. Would you agree? Liquor. It has wholeness. That depends on the bread. That's right. That's right. But aren't we all interested if someone tells us, hey, there's a bakery that really has the most excellent bread? We raise an eyebrow and we're interested. It's a staff of life. Right? Bread is the staff of life. Aren't we interested in bread? Good bread? Not homemade bread, maybe. It has to be very good. Oh, so that we can use the word wholeness, can we not, with bread? Naturally. All right. Now, if there is therefore such a thing as wholeness, well, before there was, uh, before it could become a wholeness, there had to be all of the parts brought together into a whole. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. All the parts had to come together into a whole. Then, just because you have all the parts together into a whole, that doesn't mean yet that, that there is a unity of the parts. It just means you have all the parts together. So, you have to, have to bring together all the parts together. It has to become into a unity and 
that bringing together these parts for bread, whatever that unity is, there must be some continuation of it. It it can't be just for a moment. Therefore, there has to also be some power that holds it together. So then, there is something that must bring it together. The parts have to be brought together into a unity. When you have all the parts together in a whole, now you have to do something with it. You have to make it unitary. You have to bring it together. You have to bake it. You have to do something very important to transform it into a unity. Because as long as the parts remain distinct and separate, you're not going to have a unity. You're going to have just a mixture of parts. Then what holds it together, see? So if, if there is this wholeness, then what makes whole, what makes whole, right? That wholeness, what makes whole, must be, thing, must be something that brings it together and holds it together into a unity so the parts now are transformed into some unitary form. To that degree, you know, to that very degree, it's uh, all, the, the, all the parts, the whole, the unity, well, it becomes a one, doesn't it? It becomes a one. It has a oneness to it, and we can, by heavens, we can call it a one. Then, look, now we want to talk about this curious word, condition. Now, this is where we now begin this curious game called speculating. Now, we can talk about, we want to move away from the bread, and we talk about a human being, all right? Would you agree we can assign that term, wholeness, to health? Health is another word we can assign to wholeness, can't we? All right. Now, as we look at the word health in a man or a woman and assign the word wholeness to it, we see a wholeness. Does the same language apply? All the parts have to be together. There has to be some continuation of health. It has to be held together. It has to be unitary. So in some sense, would you agree as long as healthiness endures, then the parts will fit together harmoniously. Harmoniously. Working together. And what's quite remarkable is that when it works together, you can forget about it. Isn't health the condition where you no longer have to worry about the body? It's an ideal state. But the, you know, you can't forget about it because you have to continue. If you quit being, doing healthy things, yes. you're yeah. lose your health. That's absolutely right. That's right. That's right. Right. But when it's, he- when it's present, healthiness is present, it's, it, there are no footprints of healthiness. There's no ringing in the ear that, to remind you that you're healthy. It has no marks, but by its presence, by its presence, presence, it brings together a one, doesn't it? And it allows a new condition to emerge that could never have existed before. It allows a person, therefore, to develop whatever goals they have or interests they have and they don't have to concern themselves with themselves. They're no longer an object of worry and concern. With health you can direct your efforts elsewhere. So it provides a freedom. 
Mm-hmm. Now, let's just talking about bread and health. By the way, does it look like we can talk about the, the healthy man or woman with the same language you use for bread, good bread, wholesome bread? Hmm. Relations are constant, the terms may change. Terms being the bread and the man. But these are all relations, and therefore we can switch back and forth and talk about the bread or the man. So therefore, so long as that presence of wholeness, as long as the presence of wholeness remains, then all of those other factors persist. Well, let me just look now. Notice, as we talk, we can substitute lovers, learning, and contemplation. Won't make any difference. Would you agree that when you're involved in learning, jump to learning, there's something you want to do you want to be in the kind of state of mind where you can identify all the parts you're considering. You want to be able to bring them together. You want to bring all the parts together so you can see each part distinctly. And you'd like to then see it in as a unity. And when you see it as a unity, you'd like that unitary way in which you can see all the parts together. You'd like to have that remain. When you see all the parts relating in the way in which they do, you might say the ideas themselves have a certain harmonious relationship between one another. Ah, then you can see the diverse multiplicity now as a oneness, can't you? Oh, wait a minute then. Then if that's the case, then this brings about a completion, doesn't it? The learning brings about a completion. Uh, bread's complete too healthiness is complete and that's the very condition for perfection isn't it we can now talk about perfection we can apply it to these two cases let's see what happens if we try it with lovers try it with lovers First, I'm always amazed that, um, and I'm sure you share the same amazement, that people that we know who are involved in relationships, any number of them, and especially love relations, they begin to see they're attracted to people who have some kind of likeness to their own parents. And what's amazing about it is that some people can go to a party where there are hundreds of people and they just naturally gravitate to someone and they get in a relationship with that person and later they're amazed to find that of all the people they could have talked to, they pick someone who much to their surprise psychologically is very similar to their mother or their father. It's like people have antennas and radar and they go, ooh. <coughs> then there is something then that brings them together. Now, we can either take it as a neurotic tendency or we can elevate it and say, no, 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 if there's that process going on, it could also be positive. It doesn't have to be neurotic. So therefore, right, there is something then that can draw these two people together. It brings them together. Whatever they discover, whatever they discover, holds it together, holds the relationship together. It maintains itself. They then can talk about a unity. Then they can talk, can they not, 
about harmoniously working together to preserve the union. They could then say, depending upon uh, the vision they have for their own relationship, they both then can form a kind of a triangle. That is, if they both have an ideal about how they should both be, then this ideal we can talk about separately. Right? To the degree that they share an ideal and they understand that that's what they both want, then that ideal becomes a third factor and that can then bring about a kind of perfection to the degree to which it's noble and has integrity to it. And therefore they become, they become through this like the ideal. And therefore they enter into an interesting kind of union that brings about a perfection that's a completeness. They can then experience a certain degrees of completeness. And that brings about a higher kind of union. And to the degree that they can participate in it, their particular differences are not, any, are not significant in any way, for they can stay in a state of oneness. By the way, could I use the same language for bread? That learning, same language. Even though I'm talking about different things. I'm talking about bread, people, learning. Is that right? You didn't use the wholeness this time. Pardon? You used wholeness for the bread, but you didn't use it for yeah. the could we not say that the degree to which this emerges, that's wholesome? And we can say, therefore, that there's certain kinds of learning that are wholesome, certain kinds of relations are wholesome, certain kind of bread is wholesome. Now look. Look at this jump now we're going to make. We're saying that there is something that pulls them together, didn't we? We said people have antennas, radar, and they can see one another. Now, we're now going to say the condition for that, the condition for that attraction, the condition for that kind of attraction is that each are trying to see something, trying to discover something that's good. And would you agree a relationship only exists so long as they both have that vision that each is good and together they can be better and to the degree that that is seen as bringing about its opposite to that degree they depart. That's all. Um, once the vision comes in or the idea comes in that this is not good no matter what else is present, it falls away. Agree? No matter how good the bread looks, no matter how you may touch it, regardless of the smell of everything else, if there is the, the suspicion, which is later confirmed, that there is something bad about that bread, we don't want anything to do with it, even though it has all the appearance of all the other beautiful qualities. Now let's go from that. All right? Proclus is now going the next step and he's saying, you know what's behind all of that? These people, all nature, whales, anything, all nature, is really seeking their good. And therefore the driving force behind this is the good. The good. Capital, right? The good. He said, the goodness brings about the wholeness of all beings. Ah, conditional. But what makes whole, what makes whole, 
and holds together the being of each one of these because each one of these has to persist in the being which they are is the one that's the one that's operator let's do it again okay the good therefore brings about the wholeness of this relationship right? but what makes whole and holds together the integrity of each, the being of each, the integrity of each with their ideal oh wow that's the one and to the degree in which they are pursuing this triangular relationship remember three, one, two, three, this is the ideal <clears throat> To that degree, then, each becomes like the ideal. They're transformed. Because that process of likeness, as it completes itself, makes them one. And therefore, behind it all is this oneing. Well, therefore, for those to, to whom it's present, this the good, to those to whom it's present, you know what it does? It brings completion. Each person then becomes, by the challenge, more complete. And it holds together according to that union. According to that union, holds together. According to that union, holds together. No. Look. It brings together, right? That's what we said. Brings together, holds together the being of each, and in that way it perfects each according to its presence. Therefore, that kind of unity is itself good. And if so, then the good as it functions in this way, it unifies. Well, if it unifies, then uh, union is good, right? If the good is what unifies, then union is good. Well, it brings completion as one, holds together according to the union, to unity, unification, and union. Well, then, huh, that's good to know. then if that's the case, that's the grounds for perfecting. What is? Then there is in nature, there is as part of our reality, these powers that are bringing together the goodness of all things, regardless of where you find it. Now, let's take an example. Notice we can we, we can make the slightest change in this, slightest change in this. Cappuccino. Now, there are two people coming together to talk in a dialogue. Would you not agree we can use this entire language now and talk about the significance of dialogues under these conditions? Would you agree when two people get together, if they have an ideal in their mind <clears throat> of how to be fair with one another, how to pay attention to the words that are being used, how to be careful enough to allow the other party to develop in such a way that whatever they are thinking, they give them enough room and time to express it, and if they need help in making it more perfect, the other person is willing to share and go along and bring that about. Would you not agree then this third thing between them is a very interesting insight into what is possible through dialogue? If that's true, then in that dialogue that they may participate in, the various ideas they're talking about becomes into a whole, 
and has a wholeness. The ideas are brought together through their reflection. And to the degree that they can maintain the discussion, it's held together. And therefore, they can reach for meaning that allows, to, allows itself to continue beyond them, but they share it together. So they're working together harmoniously. They then share a unity. And to that degree, whatever they are, whoever they are, drops away, and they're just following the logos, the word. To that degree, then, they reach meaning, which is one. Then they experience a kind of freedom, because they're able then to do that with the greatest respect for one another and for the word. Well, wait a minute, then. What does that do to someone? What does that do? Well, then this third thing between them is the logos. They're, they're then appreciative of the logos, of the word, of rationality, intelligibility in the universe, and they can share their highest or more interesting experiences with one another in the effort to try to make it even more intelligible and to share that. Well, then they're functioning uh, more ideal to the degree then that they are participating in this with this standard. They themselves are becoming like that ideal and they too become rational, intelligible, and enter into a union and a oneness. Hmm. <laughs> if that's the case, then through the Logos, it perfects each according to its presence. Hmm. Curious, isn't it? Right. It really brings about that very strange condition. Now, Would you agree we're using a set of terms, the same set of terms, bread, lovers, dialogue, learning, and we're leaving out contemplation for a while. And we can find that the vocabulary that we're using in one, we can shift to the other, and therefore the relations that we find among thing, these kinds of things are constant, and the only thing that changes, whether we're talking about bread or people, or lovers, or learning, so therefore, we're develop, developing a vocabulary that allows us to see the intelligibility behind these four domains. Ah, now, let's go back to this. Now we enter into the realm of contemplation. All right, so first, uh, let me ask you. I just led you quickly through an exercise, sharing a certain language. Miss, what's it like to go through this? Reflective. Reflective? Yeah, it causes one to reflect. On what? On all those ideas. On all those ideas. Now, if you're following this, then you can say by reflecting on all these ideas, what you are really seeing running through the whole thing is just nothing other than one and the idea of the good and the various ways in which you can break it down. Well, I've seen this happen where people are happily in love. Yeah. Yeah. This is always true. But yeah. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. 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 Good. No, uh, Socrates had a relationship with his wife. It was a little different. Yeah. That's true. He had more. Yeah. It's had two. They provided some need for each other. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd like to try something now. I'm going to give you something to read. And. I think you will grasp every single word of it with me. We're now reading the 13th proposition of Proclus. There are two translations. I'm going to use the one on the bottom. That's Barbara Stecker's translation. 
Now, the thing I ignored all right, was the opening statement. See whether you can go along with me now. See? Every good unifies what shares in it. Have we said that? Yeah. See? Every good, whether we're talking about the bread or an ideal dialogic relationship or lovers right, or learning, right? every good unifies what shares in it. All union is good, good in the one or the same. Now notice the language. If indeed the good brings about the wholeness of all beings, but what makes whole and holds together the being of each is the one, then the good for those it's present to brings completion as one and holds together according to the union. I'm skipping the parentheses. So let, let me go back. Have we talked about the first line? Here it is. If indeed the good brings about the wholeness of all beings, but what makes whole, see if there's wholeness, it presupposes there's whole, presupposes, and holds together the being of each who sees the word being, is the one, then the good for those it's present to brings completion as one and holds together according to the union. Let's try it. Take any phrase in there or sentence and let's apply it to any one of our four categories. We have five, of course, but we're only using four at the moment. Uh, I think I have a marker over here. Ah, yeah. Sometimes that's called a dialogical relationship. So, let's try it. Take any, which sentence would you like? Take that anyone. The one is primarily the good. Now that implies a uh, uh, lack there. Why would you just say the one is the good? If you say it primarily, that means there's something uh, missing. Yeah. See, if the way we're talking about it, this good brings something about. What does the good bring about? Well, it brings about completion. That brings things into a higher unity. It holds it together, brings it together, holds it together. That's one. Therefore, the good, even though it's not normally considered that way, primarily, it's one. So the game, you see, of Proclus is that you can take any of his propositions and you can just change the terms and see the same thing in it. Whenever you're wondering about any one of them, you can just jump it. Put in other terms and the same relations are going to hold. And that's the secret of the dialectic. Basically, it's simple. Now, if we can talk this way, if we can talk this way, what happens now if we now talk this way about contemplation? So first, what is it like to go through this and see that you can use this language in our four categories, bread, lovers, the dialogic relationship, and learning? Does it not render them all intelligible? Gives a vocabulary for it, you can share it. I'm always interested in this question. What difference does it make to be able to see that and think in this way? What difference does it make? 
I think it makes one difference. You can always talk to the great bread maker, whose bread is wholeness, has a quality of wholeness to it consistently, and you can talk to him and you can say, how do you account for the fact that you have the most excellent bread? How does it distinguish itself from you? We could go to people who, who can then dialogue in this ideal way. We can say the same thing. What are the difficulties you had to overcome in order to function in this way? Because they must have encountered difficulties to achieve it. Should they not then, in some way, be able to give us insight in how they were able to bring all the ideas together, bring themselves together, how they had to hold it together over difficulties? how they had to bring about a harmony in their reasoning between the two of them and with an ideal. And that's helpful, isn't it? Because that means you can make distinctions in what you're doing that's significant. And I think those are the great four, five things. Right? Good food. Right? Love, dialogical relationships, learning, and finally, contemplation. So, shall we risk the next one? Contemplation. Notice, you have the sheet, you have the language we can use. One of the most interesting questions I think that most people encounter in this whole game of contemplation is wouldn't you agree that sitting, formal sitting, is not contemplation? Otherwise, anyone who has lost their legs would be a natural contemplator. Right. So, you could ask someone who is into this art of contemplation, Sir, when you, if, you, if they do, let us say, formally sit, we can say, Sir, when is it you would say you're contemplating and when are you sitting? Because just sitting isn't contemplation. Right. Ah. Then they'd wake up and they'd say, what? And would say, oh, no, no, please don't take offense. Don't take offense. Now let's assume now we can then proceed with this dialogue and we have that ideal of the Logos before us. And if the person is open to exploring it, right? We could say, now look here, in your past, would you agree there are times when you can say you were in fact contemplating rather than just sitting? Wouldn't you agree? Yes. And wouldn't you agree a good part of what is called sitting or contemplation is to make the transition from sitting to contemplating? Now look, would you agree that uh, the contemplator He may, at that time, sitting on his cushion, think he's avoiding a life of action, but what happens is therefore all the action takes place in his mind. And now he has to struggle with a higher kind of action, the thoughts the, and all that they bring with them and bombard us with them. And therefore, would you agree to the degree that these thoughts dominate Ideas, images, feelings dominate. They're just sitting. And they finally have to reach the point where there has to be a change. There has to be a change. Now, would you agree what happens is that each one of these thoughts, images dominate and they are often at war with other ones. So there's an internal conflict going on. <clears throat> that people should become absorbed in some of these 
train of thoughts, sometimes called fantasies, sometimes called thoughts. And therefore, to that degree, they're sitting, though they're trying to settle their mind in order to do this other thing. Well then, they build up jariki, concentration. They bring their mind back to the same thing, back to their koan, their breathing, whatever their exercise is. Slowly, that curve increases. They finally are able to maintain somewhere in here more and more, focusing on the breath, focusing on the koan, mantra, whatever it is they're doing. When that occurs, to that occurs, there is a point where they recognize they are no longer besieged by this earlier condition and a relaxation takes over. Now sitting begins. Now contemplation begins. Now, then those thoughts have to come, right, they have to be dealt with, and then there's a state that emerges, right? When you're more focused now, they call it focus, what it really means is it's simply not dispersed because you're always concentrated, but you're f f concentrating on particulars. So now you focus. It's easier to focus and to the degree that that can be held, right, to the degree that you can hold that state or that state is held, let us call it that way, to the degree that state is held, then you are exploring not what comes to you, but you're now exploring the state of mind. Huh. There, in order for a contemplation to function, that focus has to be held, has to be maintained. <clears throat> right? It has to be held together. Now, that's jerky. It focuses and it holds on to it. Then, for those to whom it's present, it brings a completion, a sense of completion. Then the higher problem occurs. Would you agree? The most difficult problem of all of this <coughs> is now to bring back, bring back the thoughts on a higher level. Self-congratulations. Self-judgments, congratulations, self-judgments. And these then become a higher class of thoughts that begin to absorb one, just as the earlier ones did in the fragmented nature. And therefore, to that degree, one loses one's root that focus, and one is then fragmented and has to go back and start it all over again. <coughs> So it's the subtle art of, it's a subtle art, though simple, of letting the mind be the way it is without, without in any way forcing it to be anything other than a seeing. Without in any way grasping on to any of these emergent states of being, experiences, or thoughts. To that degree, to that degree, that's a seeing then without, a, without an object. It's the use of the mind functioning where there is a seeing without an object. There's an awareness then that is not attached to anything and to the degree that that then is allowed, cultivated. Of course, you don't cultivate that. What you cultivate is the, the non-intrusion. To that degree, it brings about a completion. And to hold, that, to hold that is to hold it together in terms of a union.
well then look here you see here's our problem see we talked about the logos here we talk about the logos with lovers we talked about the logos in a dialogical relationship and here's what's interesting is it possible that an intelligible an intelligible grasp of the dynamics of meditation and contemplation would share in the very same things we talked about when we talked about the bread, the lovers, the dialogic relationship, or learning. Then there should be an intelligible model that won't tell you what to do but will warn you about falling away from what is. And therefore that's a freedom. It's not telling you what to do. It's just letting you know not to be to become distracted by what is not essential. That confidence in one's ability to persist in that, of course develops with experience, but nonetheless, uh, it's a trust in the fact that there is a union to mind and mind is intelligible. It's not at war with itself. The parts are not at war. Our relationships are not in conflict. But that through that union and that completeness we can reach a wholeness. And therefore this is the dream of getting a map of consciousness as sometimes it's called. If it is, by the same language, it should bring the better parts of ourselves together, hold together that state, right? and perfect it according to the presence of our ability to hold on to that, why not be distracted from it? And that kind of unity is itself good, and the good then unifies naturally the contemplator. Same language? Same language. So therefore, learning this language with bread in relations, in learning, in dialogical relationships, gives you the skill and the confidence, and then you can just move it over here and find the similar things. So let me now turn to that great sheet, and I have a line I'd like to go to now. So I'm going to go to two lines. If the one is what brings together and holds together beings, it perfects each according to its presence. Going back into the preceding paragraph. The good for those it is present to brings completion. The good brings completion. The one perfects according to its presence. The good brings completion. See, it has a power. This is where we now separate from all our other considerations. I alluded to it. I said before that somehow people have an antenna or a radar where they can spot one another at a great distance. Right. Look here. This is saying there is some power in the nature of our reality which is good and that itself has such a power that it can account for all the relationships that exist depending upon how receptive you are to the models that exist. To the degree that you're receptive to the models that exist, you then become like the model. And becoming like the model, model is the principle of likeness. To that degree, there's a presence of the good, there's a presence of the one. One brings completion, the other brings perfection.
Thus, every good unifies what shares in it. All union is good. The good is the same as the one. It's my favorite proposition. Therefore, goodness is union, union is goodness, and the good is the one, the one is primarily the good. Now, let's play. What would you like to ask about it? Because I have the same question I had before, I'll ask you if you don't have one. And that is, what does it do to go through this and see this language and the way it can be used? Does it matter? Well, it brings about a contemplation. I don't know if you call it a contemplation, but if you can hold on to all the things that you're saying, that in fact is following. Hold on to that. Say. And that means how much of our lives deal with those five categories. If you learn to, to use this kind of language, right, if you use this kind of language, then you're understanding through this language these different dimensions with the same language. Now it gives, it gives the, uh, it's just feeling of, of uh, Contemplation, the ability to contemplation. The ability to contemplation. So, so successful people do. They, it's like they talked about the ram. The ram points mm -hmm. directly and straight to the central. And we can do that, get to the central, and we can laugh at the gods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is the challenge for our age. This is the real challenge. Get out of relativism, get into self-explorations, find wholeness in the logos throughout everything we do. Because with this language, it doesn't make any difference what you're dealing with, you're using the same language, it means you're seeing through this logos, naturally, all the time. And that's a continuous contemplation, isn't it? Draws you into it, right? Draws you into it, you see through it, that's the logos. That's what's called logos. It applies whether you're an actor or a businessman. That's right. Oh, artist, yeah. Musician. Supposed yeah. To be musician. We can put music in here, can't we? Circle of fifths. The logos of music is the circle of fifths. Right. That's right. Mm-hmm. The actor has to get completely involved in the role that he's playing. If he doesn't, he loses it. That's right. It. That's very true. That's when they lose it. Mm hmm. Well. Let's see. Let's go back and take a look at the last thing now. Right. The whole process we're going through is saying each term in our sequence is like the one preceded and like the one that follows, for likeness governs all of the terms. One. All right, let's clean up our terms like we were doing before. The good. Clearly, oneness. Goodness. Now, another word for oneness is a henad, which is the same word as oneness. So we'll leave it, all right? If a thing has a oneness, well, 
Mums bija jauni, jauni arī. As a unity, then there must have been a union of its parts. If there's a union of its parts, then there had to be a unification. If there is a unification and a unity and a unity and a oneness, then this process, or what's unfold, going the other way, the process goes back, progressively, it, this is a procession going this way, a procession of turns, and this is a returning, a reversion. Well, if that goes on, now we can use the terms, that's a perfecting, that's a perfecting turning about, coming back to itself. If that's a perfecting, that presupposes there must have been some completeness. Now we can use the other two terms. Right? Then, look here, we just don't want these things. We also want, if there's a goodness, we want it to be, the pro we want it to be held together, held together. the need to, to be held together, the parts coming together into a higher union or a unity. Right? And that process of uh, being held together, brought together, drawn together, going further down, drawn together, attraction. All of these are just going backwards, slightly different as the terms proceed. Therefore, this language has parallels going back and forth, so you can make up your statements using these terms. Then you apply it to any one of the categories you're in, And then you can combine them, and that's the way Proclus proceeds. Brilliant as hell. <laughs> right. What's the one governing idea? For any two steps, for any of these two ideas, there is a, an overlap that presupposes to that degree A, B, then there is an AB and a BA in this mixture. That's the mean. A mean is a likeness. Therefore, the difference between any two successive terms is nothing other than a mean between them. All right. And you can take any three terms and the middle one would be a mean too. You can take it that way as well. So therefore the whole thing that runs through this entire reality and exploration is one word, likeness. And in the Plato's time is, of course, um, the one supreme principle upon which all creation is based is likeness. For God desired to generate the universe like himself. And therefore, the idea of likeness is the primary theological, philosophical term of the most important, probably the greatest importance. Because likeness presupposes part of this is becoming more like this and part of this is becoming more like that. If the lower AB, you're talking about progression, returning, right? procession going the other way, Therefore, BA, AB going back, ABA going the other way. Procession and reversion. Mm -hmm. Good. More like the model. Now, in Plato's uh, Phaedrus, I want to make it well known that this is where he talks about the fact that uh, when people come together, 
they may choose various models. And there are only a finite number of models and each of the models can be represented or personified by a god. Therefore, for Plato and the Platonic tradition, a relationship, that relationship depends upon people agreeing to that model. Now, of course, if they have two different models, we know what happens. <laughs> then there's a battle over which model I want to become, you want to become. So that in Plato's Phaedrus, each one of the gods is represent, represents the personification of a certain model. When people come together, therefore, in some kind of relationship then, they both agree to become like that model and that becomes then a triune relationship. And therefore the highest ones as you go through the gods obviously is more significant as you proceed as Zeus becomes the highest figure since Zeus and Zeus are the same. Right? Intellect. And we ought to do the Phaedrus. We ought to do the Phaedrus. It's, it's so beautiful. We'll do that maybe sometime. Good. I like it. I, I like it very much. Enjoy it. Like it. Look at it. Reflect on it. It's very interesting if you memorize those. Memorize it. Put in your head several propositions. 13, 148, 23, 24. It's a set of them. Very, because then you can use that language, especially 148, which we did here once. So thank you very much. I really enjoyed the opportunity to share this with you. And uh, pardon, me? louder. I was thinking that the idea of uh, those analogies really does pull it out of the perceptual realm. The analogies really pull it out well, of the perceptual realm. Talk about it more. Well, when you see it as an intelligible model, that means it's not percept perceptible. You're seeing it as relationships, but you can't, you don't see relationships. Yes. Yes. Our training is to put the significance on things. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, what, that's what's real, things. This game is saying, wait a minute, it's the relations. Understand relations. That's the key, not things. Things are things. Things change. A thing is this today and that tomorrow. And it's a mystery what it really is in itself as it goes through all of its changes. But relations are constant. That's, its, that's the intelligibility. And of course, science explores things and they end up studying relationships of the parts to the parts to the parts of parts, etc. When I studied logic at the Jesuit University, they never touched on this at all. Yeah. Just a syllogism to them as a whole. Yeah. Um, we are a strange people. We have turned away from our greatest spiritual giants. And that's, of course, Europe. Europe has done that primarily. We follow Europe like a dog follows his master. Time to separate ourselves from Europe, from my way of thinking. I mean, not that they haven't contributed greatly, but there's a greatness in the Hellenic model that Europe was never able to absorb. Oh, you know, right from the beginning. And the degree that they were able to take this was only during the period and for as long as they thought they could reconcile it with Christianity. Once they saw that they couldn't reconcile it with Christianity, they dropped it and it dropped out of all the universities. It was once part of our culture up to the 17th century. At one time in Europe, was thought that if you were Christian, you were rational. If you were rational, you were a Christian because they had this as their background. And of course, that all changed when they discovered that the writings they thought were Christian were forgeries produced by pagans or Hellenics. So that changed overnight. Yeah. So now we live in a society where we agree there's a separation of church from state 
And what that really means is our education then is so secular that it has no meaning. Because you can have a metaphysics that isn't Christian, <clears throat> isn't Jewish, isn't anything other than itself. Helen. To become rational is to become Hellenic. I, I, that's, I mean. that's, that's really where the world should be going, I think. The Christian documents were kind of analogies. It's a different kind of logic. Pardon me? They, they were? The Christian yeah. ideas are not a, they're a different kind of logic. Um, for myself, Christianity is, is a, uh, uh, as it is represented, I think, as we mentioned before, that uh, probably nothing has undermined Christianity more than Sunday schools, yeah. and nothing has undermined philosophy more than universities. Yeah. And see, Christianity developed for at least seventeen to eighteen hundred years when they no, no one had the Bible. That is to say none of the literate public were able to keep a Bible. It wasn't until the 14th century you were caught with a translation in English of the Bible, you were put to death immediately. Right? It was only until the 18th, 17th, beginning of the 17th century that uh, the King James was available, which is a poor translation. So therefore, when people try to understand it in terms of the text, they're carrying along a tradition and they're different, they don't merge. If you drop the tradition and understand it, it's saying something entirely different. The, which it has to be, since they're separate and distinct. One developed completely uh, separate and distinct from the other. So. so it's a very sad case. But I think that there's good, good reason to, to suspect that uh, things are changing in well, theology and theologians. The Sunday school I went to, to try to brainwash you into agreeing to certain things without any thought behind it. You're supposed to believe things. Mm. You're supposed to believe things without any credulity. Yeah. Well. So you didn't learn to think, you just learned to believe. Yeah. yeah. So if you had the right beliefs, then you'd be all right. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Good. What is this word, Jeriki, that's up there? Which it's one? Jeriki. Oh, Jeriki. Excuse me, that's a word that Buddhists use uh, for a special kind of concentration. See, there's a difference between what we call concentration and what Buddhists call concentration. Concentration, in the Buddhist language, jiriki, is, uh, is a state that has to be realized. It's when the mind is unified. When the mind is unified, then a certain power is available to the person whose mind has been unified. And with that new kind of power, it can go in a variety of places, and you can use it in a variety of places. But the essential mark of this power is that it allows the individual to function much more spontaneously without having to reflect about doing things. And most often, their actions and what they do is quite appropriate to the circumstances. Therefore, it has a kind of built-in wisdom to it. It's not prajna, which is a higher kind of wisdom, but it's, a, it's the kind of wisdom where what you're doing is appropriate to the circumstances. Whether you should be in the circumstances or not is not, it, and not part of jariki. <laughs> That's part of the, the problem of prajna. So normally what people mean by concentration is being able to keep your mind on one object or thought for a certain period of time. That's not this then. This is when the mind has been unified and um, naturally a power emerges. And, and that's what's significant. Naturally a power emerges which then becomes available for the individual for spiritual or other purposes. A person to relate to the problem at hand, in other words, give your full that's right. energy to whatever. Full force of your, full full force force of your brain. Energy. That's right. That's what it can do. Yeah. 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 Good. Okay, so how does prajna differ? <laughs> what, what? Prajna. Prajna differs. Yeah. Prajna is only a as as, uh, Prajna emerges with a kensho, with enlightenment. Okay, I gotcha. And uh, f 
for some people, there's no, for some, and there are cases, or people hold the position, I should say, where they think jiriki is sufficient, such as martial arts. That's where they develop jiriki. And they think that's sufficient because it allows them to act spontaneously, it's appropriate to what's going on, it allows them to have with the full force of their being directed towards a goal. But it's not prajna, because prajna presupposes that you're in the state of mind where you, it is obvious whether or not you should be there at all. And therefore, it, it, uh, it should in some way bring you to uh, uh, what is called the, the nature of being or the nature of reality, which gives means then you get an insight that there is no difference fundamentally between yourself and the nature of reality. And that's prajna, and that's a big difference then the full force of your being being directed and available. Good. Thank you. <laughs>